everyone, and, um, and thank you to the organizers of the exhibition. It's a, a, a very fitting context in which to be speaking about the, the things that I'm concerned with. And um, I thought I would do two things. One is to talk a little bit about this this preoccupation with the notion of research, what I'm trying to articulate is the process of becoming research, um, the, the role of research, not just in kind of academic inquiry, but really as, I, I, I think really as a way of producing new realities. I think research is a mode of, of producing new realities. And, and that's kind of what, what um, I want to try and get at. But I thought maybe I'll talk a little bit about that and then show you this big project that we did in Bergen last year, um, which is a, um, a, a very large scale triennial. And um, this project is on infrastructure and it's an ongoing project. It's it's about to enter its second phase. And so I thought maybe that, that would be sort of a good balance to talk a, a little bit about research and to maybe exemplify it by putting on a, um, um, illustrating it with a project, which is a project of public study and public research, which is what Free Thought, which is the collective I work with, um, is really devoted to. We're not really exhibition makers. We're interested in public study and public research. And exhibitions are the collateral damage of our interest. <laughs> so um, I'll read a little bit, talk a little bit, and show a little bit, OK? And leave plenty of time for, for discussion. So to begin with, a shift. In the past, we assumed we knew what education was about. It was an encounter with the world at another level through a set of personal transformations. In the past, we also thought we knew what research was about. An investigation into the world around us in order to ground bodies of knowledge. But with the advent of ever more virulent neoliberal managerialism and rampant cognitive capitalism, we have had to constantly revise our understanding of both, of both education and research. So as not to lose their capacity for critical and resistant invention. If we pursue a model of knowledge is singularity, never universal, and constantly reinventing its alliances with far-flung insights, practices, and protocols, we might have a form of learning that is not so easily captive by dominant cultures of evaluation and prediction. So one of the shifts that we are facing is a shift in which on the, on the one hand, we want models of knowledge that are geared towards our particular subjectivity. And on the other hand, we want models of knowledge that are not so easily captured by kind of dominant technocratic, which means that as always with everything, we are kind of navigating a, a variety of, of aims simultaneously. Wendy Brown has called this permeating intensity of neoliberalism's holistic capture a stealth revolution, a revolution that one does not really recognize as taking place around one, a stealth revolution. It is governing conduct as if it were granting liberty. We have, it would seem, more space in which to succeed, to expand, to act on our ambitions, 
to financialize everything, which in turn grants us more revenue, which in turn feeds the management by algorithms with data that serves as indicators for targets or for achievements. In permeating our actions, neoliberal conditioning shows how it has captured subjectivity. And this, this is kind of, of, of really important because on the face of it, we can probably do a pretty straightforward analysis of neoliberal managerialism. I think we understand it. What I think is much more complicated to understand is the capture of subjectivity by neoliberalism because these seem antagonistic to one another. And the, the sort of the stealth revolution that Wendy Brown is referring to is really the, the revolution of the ability to capture subjectivity. If subjectivity delineated the arena of stakes and relations, of affinities and solidarities, of shared imaginations and shared criticalities, the multiple and often dissident, dissonant positions of the subject. In its hijacked form, it is geared to achievement, success, forging new markets and new desires for more than commodities for affects, for energies, for expansion, growth, reach, brand recognition, and credit. Above all, for credit. And uh, this, this I take from the work of Michel Ferrer, who's, um, who lives here in Paris, and has written um, some quite remarkable texts on non-governmental politics and on geopolitics and um, on the kind of, of the, the reign of credit, which is kind of neoliberalism's dominant economy these days. Education then could offer the possibility of deconditioning from neoliberalism's permanent logistical conditioning. So one of the things that um, <coughs> One of the things that we're kind of moving towards is this notion of education as a process of deconditioning, rather than education as the collection of knowledge, the a kind of empirical grounding. So it's, um, and, and this is really important because one of the things that we recognize now is our need to shift away from a politics of resistance, a politics of opposition, to a politics of deconditioning. And this is precisely because neoliberalism kind of capture of subjectivity. Because when you're operating at the level of subjectivity, a, a, a captured subjectivity, <coughs> non, equally so, what, you're, what you don't have is the ability to externalize and oppose, right? Because mm -hmm. things are internalized, values are internalized. Mm -hmm. So the, the sort of notion of education and research as a process of deconditioning, active, ongoing, with no proper result um, at, at its end, but something that we have to do to work on ourselves all the time, is I think really important here. So education then could offer the possibility of deconditioning from neoliberalism's permanent logistical condition, conditioning. It is initially a form of gathering. So this, this is, again is really important to me that education is not somebody telling other people things about something, but it's a form of gathering. That all education takes place as a form of gathering. A transgenerational <coughs> set of exchanges of what Bernard Stiegler calls trans-individuation. Let us be less occupied with who is coming together for what reason. Some want to be transformed, some want to obtain very specific knowledge, some want to be professionalized, some want a pathway to employment through obtaining degrees, some want the credibility, status, and confidence they associate with having a degree. 
So let us be less preoccupied with that and recognize that regardless of why we have come, we are together, sharing space, sharing online teaching platforms, sharing libraries, sharing pints in the pub, sharing complaints about the overload of assessed work. At moments of crisis, and there have been so many of these recently, Syria, civil war, Brexit, Trump, North Korea, collapsing healthcare systems, the depression suffered by our students facing huge fees, a shrinking job market, and a chronic inability to get into adequate housing, the death of our friend and colleague Mark Fisher. In these crises, we find ourselves together able to turn the spaces of teaching to spaces of questioning, analyzing, raging, mourning. We enact Stefano Harney and Fred Moten's <coughs> fugitive study, using the urge to learn, to turn away from disciplinary curricula, outcomes, and exams, towards an, an engagement with the conditions we're living out. I, I don't know if this book has um, as much of an impact in France as it has in the English-speaking world, but um, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's Undercommons, if you're, if you're familiar with it. It's, um, it's a book you can't buy, you can only download a free copy online. So you put in Undercommons and you get a copy of it. And I think it's a really fantastic book for moving thinking along. And they have a particular discussion which is on what they call fugitive study. So study that takes place, let's say, within an environment of study, like a university or wherever, but is, is not sort of, of the result of anybody teaching you anything. It's a kind of using the, the situation of study to create a completely independent curriculum. Um, so I'm, uh, there's a, an artist, um, he is from Kurdistan. His name is Hiva K. do you know him? So Hiva had one great desire, which was to go to the art academy in Mainz in Germany. I don't know why. <laughs> but this is what his great desire was. And, um, but he couldn't because he was from Kurdistan and he did not have residency and all of these things. So he traded identities with a young man in Germany and he went to the Mainz Art Academy as this young man. When he got there, he never went to a single class or studio crit or anything like that. He set up a teaching practice inside the Mainz Academy. <laughs> He taught um, the guitar to the custodians. He taught the students how to cook Kurdish food with a video link of his mother from Suleimania. <laughs> he taught all kinds of things. And he spent four years in the Mainz Art Academy teaching all kinds of things to all kinds of people. <laughs> and he graduated. Um, and he's a really interesting artist. And it was a, a kind of performance of the desire to be within the atmospheres of learning without actually having that kind of frontal relation to a class. And um, I think it's, it's very indicative of a sort of way of understanding what education can be. Right? It can be a form of being together within a particular framework where all kinds of exchanges take place, but they're not scripted. They're not organized in advance for you as the ideal way for you to learn this, that, or the other. Education then as a form of deconditioning becomes not knowledge transfer, but the possibility of fully living the conditions we are immersed in. And that's probably my main point this evening, um, is the, the sort of education and research are processes by which we recognize the conditions we're living in. In this process, we're all, 
students, teachers, support staff, becoming researchers. It is important to me to refrain from trying to salvage what was some form of nostalgic and idealized freedom which was never that free to begin with. Not because it is defunct, but because it might not be up to the specific conditions we have to contend with, largely financialization and marketization of study and research. Away from the notion of public and towards privatized revenues, whether it be fees, external research funding, linked to predictable outcomes, business partnerships, or media chatter and digital clicks. All of these, as we know, are forms of credit. For me, deconditioning comes in the form of becoming research. It also comes with an understanding that research is not the purview of the privileged in institutions of research, but a matter of necessity. For migrants to survive, for those transitioning gender, for those who fight for justice, and for those who simply want to do no harm. So one thing that I think is really important to stress is that we have to move the notion of research away from this, um, I think in France you have a particularly um, sort of, of, of extreme example of it, which is the CNRS, right? The, the sort of, of research separated from teaching in these enormously kind of privileged um, structures. So I think that, the, the, that it is really, really important to understand research not as something that happens in, in the academy as such, but as an absolute existential necessity for the pursuit of life. Any immigrant arriving in a strange country becomes a researcher. Anybody who's transitioning gender becomes a researcher. The, the sort of, of and it, research is often a matter of survival. And we need to understand that this is not a secondary form of research, that this is a primary form of research, that it's precisely that. It's the, the <laughs> figuring out of where you are and what's available to you and what you can and can't do and where you stand in the scheme of things, that's research. So research is new realities. Now you can't see this because I'm reading it, but research is always in italics, right? I'll try and produce the italics phonetically. <laughs> research, as we experience it now, in both institutional, institutional and culturally active contexts, has moved away from stable bodies of knowledge to be excavated as well as away from recognized subjects whose validity is universally recognized. Research is now the arena in which we negotiate knowledge we have inherited with the conditions of our lives. So I, I differentiate between two types of research. Research that focuses on inherited knowledge and research that is a process by which we recognize and articulate the conditions of our lives. These are my two kind of, of understandings of research. These conditions, whether economic, geographical, or propelled by subjectivity, have become the drive, not the subject matter, but the drive of the work. And it is here, in the immersion in conditions, that research transforms from an investigative impulse to the constitution of new realities. So this, this is kind of, 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 it's interesting to me because it involves not just curiosity and finding stuff out, but it, it involves a certain leap of faith. It involves a leap of faith which says, the research I am doing it can constitute a new reality. It places us in some other level, in some, in some other kind of plateau of, of knowing. It 
It is thus that we recognize that research is not some elevated activity requiring a great deal of prior knowledge, nor is it simply the urge to find things out. It is in many ways the stuff of daily life. Every form of hardship encountered, whether one is an immigrant living out, or living out catastrophic conditions, affected by emotional sea changes, or crises of identity or of security, generates research, and everyone researches. And the forms of current research have <coughs> equally shifted as contemporary multivalent research moves between archival, documentary, conceptual, and performative modes, and utilizes everything from fictioning, docudramatizing, to mimicry of the queer animation of archives, and to structural self-instituting to produce new realities of knowledge. Moving farther and farther from the assembling of information, research has undergone a process of singularization, becoming relational in form, shifting as it changes locations and experiences, unexpected encounters, no longer framed by how it originally came into the world, the discipline or professional practice that once named it. It is, in the words of Jojo Agamben, whatever knowledge. In Agamben's terms, whatever is being such as it always matters. I'm quoting Agamben now. Singularity is thus freed from the false dilemma that obliges knowledge to choose between the ineffability of the individual and the intelligibility of the universal. So contemporary research practices occupy neither exclusively, neither the realm of universal, universally acknowledged forming, formal learning, nor the realm of pure self-expression. They are instead a harnessing of both in a new relation to one another, a relation that cannot be contained by scholarship or by individual experience, but plots out the ground for shared social communication of conditions, drives and lines of flight. New research, then, is the inhabitation of conditions in another modality, ones that respond to formal knowledge, but does not adhere to it, as well as one that invokes the subjectivity of those conditions, but that does not narrate it as such. So one, one of the things that I think is important to me is that there is, to my mind, a great deal of agency in this understanding of research because the, the conditions that we're all living globally today are ones that are very difficult to mobilize against. Problems are colossal, scales are enormous. Um, the, the sort of, what do you do against false news? The, the sort of, of standing there and yelling that it's not true is not going to get us anywhere. So the, the sort of, one of the things that I think we need to, try and, and uh, locate is new locations of agency. And the, the research is a way of dealing with conditions while not submitting to them and not mobilizing against them, but finding another way to inhabit them. One is that is informed, but says, you know, one can, one can just shift you know, one can inhabit the reality, one can shift it. I'll, I'll come back to this when I show you the, the infrastructure project. It is crucial to insist on this fundamental change in both the impulse that propels research and the new forms it takes because institutions of higher education and museums have instrumentalized advanced research practices for a host of pragmatic ends. 
in order to have reasons for expansion and variety in order to satisfy public sector demands that knowledge be produced and be shown to circulate and in order to garner whatever resources might be available and in order to claim greater numbers for their programs. Using the creative industries terminology, the three most hateful words in the English language, innovative and imaginative and cutting edge. Emergent research practices as they are presently framed within institutions are losing their critical potential as they become the latest cog in the wheel of cognitive capitalism. They are increasingly public relations sound bites in the endless pursuit of the new for higher education and cultural institutional market ends. So instead, we can keep in mind the many potential contributions that new forms of research in the art world have been able to introduce. So one of these is the possibility of making the art world more than it is, of being less captive by the market, of being more about more than tangible art, but instead having concrete forms of indicating immersive processes rather than celebrating products. So that's one sense. Another is the recognition that these new forms of hybrid and imaginative research. <coughs> I'm sorry, is there a little bit of water or something? I apologize, I have a really bad cold. So the recognition that these new forms of hybrid and imaginative research activity require an entire new vocabulary in which we begin to understand, I mean, a vocabulary that isn't linked to innovative, imaginative, cutting edge, and the fourth <laughs> world word, which I really hate, which is exciting. <laughs> this exciting new research. So a new voc vocabulary in which we begin to understand how we have gained permissions for exiting the older formations of knowledge and reforming the world around us through urgent concerns. The understanding, so this is the, the fourth, I think, and final point. The understanding that we now need to articulate new models of research as well as those for performing, <coughs> delivering, displaying, and viewing of new practices. How can displays be constantly productive rather than passively informative? What does it mean to be the viewer of research? And can it provide us with an alternative form of participation? One that is less institutionally located and more interior seeing ourselves as fields of amalgamated knowledges. It is as such that research in the contemporary sense is both a set of new relations as well as a set of critical insights. It is as such that research links hands with the ongoing desire for criticality in a world in which one cannot step outside of the problematics, cannot ever exit and have an external viewing position. Research in the final analysis is the potential for immersion and engagement without drawing conclusions and making predictions, the potential for making the world our own. So I want to stop here and um, and show you a few images and talk a little bit about this project that we did. And, um, and if there's time, because it's more important to have a discussion, if there is time later, um, I want to go back to this question, which is my question, which is what does it mean to be the viewer of research? So we're sitting here in a research exhibition, and so it's probably the ideal place to ask such a question. Um, so 
Free Thought is a collective. Uh, we came together five, six years ago. We've done, I think, three or four big projects. We're an odd collective. So, the, first of all, we're not the kind of collective of 22 year olds who like want to be together all the time. We're all academics, we have jobs, we're really busy, uh, we're a lot older, and um, we came together with a very, very specific desire, which was to take our world, out, our work, out of the university. We, we found our work um, kind of hemmed in um, by everything that I've been sort of talking about, but also reaching kind of limited audiences. And so we decided to form a collective. It's an occasional collective. We come together when we have a project. We don't eat breakfast together every morning, etc. And um, we, we're sort of uh, trying to think about new modes of delivering research. That's kind of what interests us. So this is the, these are the members, which is myself, Stefano Harney, who is a uh, logistics and critical management study person, Adrian Heathfield, who is in performance, Mao Malona is an anthropologist, Luis Moreno is an urbanist, and Nora Sternfeld is an educator. So uh, we all know each other from somewhere or other, and um, over dinner one night, six years ago, we thought we'd had enough of this, we're going to do something to create another platform. Um, should I just use the... Do you, do you have a remote? Okay. Shall I, I'll just tell you? Okay. So this, this is the infrastructure project, and um, the... Uh, to me, it's the most important thing I can show you. This is the document with which we applied. We were asked to apply for the Bergen Assembly. This is the Norwegian Triennial. It's relatively new. This was only the second edition. It's a triennial that's devoted to research. So it's not interested in big exhibitions and, and, and so on. They asked us to apply. We applied, and we applied with this document, nothing more. And the, the, so it's important to me because this is what a research project looks like. So there is a seminar program which is called the City Seminar, and um, which we taught for two and a half years in Bergen. So every five, six weeks, two of us would go to Bergen and we would teach the seminar. It was completely open. Uh, anybody could register for it. All the texts were online, but people did have to register. So it had, there was a bit of process. Um, and the, the sort of, of, so over two and a half years, we had something like 14 seminars, and with quite a large constituency, mostly artists. Students never turned up to anything. So it was mostly <laughs> artists and, and people working in, in uh, the city. Now, do you know Norway? It's very expensive, terribly expensive. So, um, in the evening of the seminar day, we had we hosted a dinner for the whole city. So it was widely circulated. Um, we often got like 150 people coming to dinner because food's really expensive. And um, after dinner, we had a lecturer that we invited, usually from abroad. And a lot of people who've been here, like Denise Ferrer de Silva, a lot of people uh, were our, our lecturers, Elizabeth Poviani. <coughs> and um, we sort of opened up the subject of that day's seminar in a much more accessible way to a much bigger public. So it was the combination of an accessible lecture and a free dinner that kind of created a constituency. Um, the, the, and then we created platforms beyond Bergen. Um, we created an online platform. Um, we recreated the Partisan Cafe, which was a very famous cafe in London between 1959 and 1963. It was the hub of the left in London in those years. I'll tell you a bit about it. 
Um, instead of an opening to our thing, we had a summit and um, it was called the Infrastructure Summit and it surprised us all, I'll tell you about that. Um, we had a series of artworks that we had commissioned and developed and we're working on the infrastructure book now. So this, this is why it's important to me because it's an integrated set of previous and ongoing and public and private and, and sort of, of research. This is a research project. Now, this is, because wherever I go, I'm asked why infrastructure. So this is my answer, okay? So infrastructure, because we are infrastructural beings. We are completely constituted out of infrastructure. And so the, the kind of, of understanding, this is, this is kind of important because Infrastructure is in the hands of the planners and the technocrats. That's where it is. And it is understood as a neutral form for the efficient delivery of whatever needs to be delivered. Sewage or water or electricity or finance capital or aircraft traffic or resources, um, etc. And it has no subjectivity, it has nothing more than a kind of notion that if you put a mechanism in place, it will deliver. So one of the things we were interested in is the, the constant kind of struggles of infrastructure all the moments in which it doesn't, you know, the blockages, the stoppages, the non-deliveries, etc. But also that infrastructure was in many ways imbued with subjectivity and we didn't know how to get at it. So this whole research project was about trying to articulate languages for the subjectivity of infrastructure, which is something we don't have. I'm not sure we have it after this project either, but it was an it was an honourable effort. So everything, every form of progress seems to rely on the notion of infrastructure. So this is Bergen's old fire station, and um, it was. It, we were told that this is one of the three venues that we can have. Um, we were told that it was empty. When we got there, we found uh, that it was not at all empty. It was occupied by the retired firemen of Bergen oh. and very militantly occupied by them. Oh. The city wanted um, to gentrify. It's a beautiful old building with an amazing courtyard. They wanted to gentrify. They wanted to turn it into, I can't remember, a conference center or something. And we were going to be the agents of their sort of gentrification. So we didn't want to be that, but we also didn't want to give up the building. And then we thought, okay, this is an infrastructural problem, so let's treat it in that kind of, of way that, that we're actually able to think it. And we decided to work with the firemen towards what they want, which is a museum of fire. Now, Bergen is built of wood. It burns up every six or seven years. The firemen put out the fire. They are the heroes of Bergen. The whole population is behind them. And so we thought, we'll work with them. We're educators. We know about art. We'll work with them. And so, um, oh, sorry, this is, my, my images are not in order. This is the city seminar. So one of the things that was really important for us is to use the civic spaces in the city. So we worked mostly in the public library and the, the library hosted us. And um, I'll show you later, we built up a library which we donated. So it was also how to create an alliance with a lot of civic institutions in the city that were doing certain kinds of work and where we would feel at home. <coughs> um, it, it's very interesting because 
we're like a bunch of very serious people. We were doing an incredibly serious research project. The university had no interest in us, and the art academy had no interest in us. And this is my experience with these kinds of projects, is that they're always ignored by the academic and, and kind of learning establishment. So um, here we are studying. Okay, so we brought in, and this is really important, research projects are lateral and they expand because you never know what kind of knowledge you're going to need. So we started six, which is free thought. We ended up almost 50 because we constantly needed more things that we didn't know how to do and how to think. So this is Issa Rosenberger. She's a very well-known Austrian artist who works largely with communities. And we asked her to come in and work over a year with the firemen and we created the Museum of Burning Questions. And this is the Museum of Burning Questions. She made a very intricate film in which she interviews them and shows their archive because they have quite a beautiful archive. And this is one of the collection, they have an amazing collection of, um, what are they called, helmets. And they also have an amazing collection of fire trucks which they kept in the old fire station. Um, this is um, Massimiliano Molona's project, it's called The End of Oil, and um, it's a project in which Bergen is the uh, center of oil drilling, of North Sea oil drilling in Norway, and oil is the foundation of Norway's wealth, and um, the oil is finished. And this is the last oil rig being built in Bergen, it's called the Edward Grieg. And um, the, the Massimiliano was able to infiltrate it through a connection in the electricians' union. He spent a year on the rig, and he made a very elaborate documentary film about this, the union struggle to not lose the rig, to not lose the oil. And because it, it's not, Norway is a welfare state, and it's not about people being unemployed it's loss of identity, and this was a very serious part of the discussion. But he also took all his research and put it in the hands of Phil Collins, who's a filmmaker, and um, asked Phil to work with this. And Phil made a, a kind of dystopian fairy tale about the end of oil and then put it in the hands of a manga studio in Japan. So we had a kind of manga dystopian fairy tale about the end of oil, and he showed the two opposite one another. So on one side we had this very documentary kind of, of, of factual story, and the other we had the fictioning of it um, through the work of an artist. Um, this is the Partisan Cafe. So first of all you see these helmets, um, which this is one of the garages of the fire station. And um, my colleague Nora Sternfeld is there in the background with glasses, sitting far away. And um, she hired a team of six educators, and um, they were with us in the seminars, they worked with us for months. And, um, and they were really properly paid with good wages and good conditions and so on. They inhabited the cafe. The cafe was open day and night. It had a constant program. It had newspapers from all over the world. It had free coffee, tea, water, I think, and beer. <laughs> and um, and it, was, it was our hub. It was where everything kind of got discussed. But they were there permanently and their job was to talk to people. So they kind of engaged in, in conversations. Um, in the background, on the wall is the, a photograph of the original Partisan Cafe. I'll show you some more. And all the gear of the firemen remained there. And, um, and the next one. Um, this is a band called Charismatic Megafauna. <laughs> and it is a girl punk drummer band um, in London. And they came 
and did a few gigs. But the cafe was like that. It was it was um, films and seminars and lectures and, and performances and a lot of screenings. It was our place to screen film programs. And all of this was part of, of, of the research project. I don't know what that, ah, oh, I know what that is. This is one of the kind of interesting things. Before in the reading group we were talking about a signification. Uh, we were landed with a truly horrible, very famous Berlin graphic design studio that the Bergen Assembly hired, had nothing to do with us. And they decided to brand us, and this is one of their efforts to brand us. And our, our name is something we scribbled one evening together. It's just lowercase italic with a dot in front, it's nothing. But they worked and worked and worked to rebrand us, and it was ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. But this is the logic of exhibition marketing. And this is what they did. They, they sort of, um, this, this is not a signification, it's obfuscation, right? <laughs> it's creating a situation which no one can understand what's going on by over-marketing, by this endless play with, with graphics. Okay, <laughs> okay. this is um, an, a, one of the, there's the, the exhibition part was in six projects, um, this is, a project by Luis Moreno, and who's an urbanist, as I said, and uh, Paul Pergus, who's an acoustic sound artist. They created a, an infrastructural machine that does absolutely nothing useful. Um, so, okay, I'll try and remember the machine. The machine is that. Six discs of Norwegian music that play all the time. A program that reads that music for emotional states. Another program that translates those emotional states into keywords. And a third program that orders books on Amazon according to those keywords. <laughs> so you see that we have bookshelves and can we have the next one? And, uh, oh, also there's a program that changes the color of the room according to the emotional state. In the end, we ended up with a thousand pointless books that made no sense whatsoever, and we uh, donated them to the public library, which so nicely hosted us for over two years. Next one. Um, okay, this is a, a bit of video that um, I'm not going to be able to show you. But if you look online on YouTube, you could probably find a video on the Partisan Cafe. Next. Uh, this is what it looked like. It was a really interesting institution, the Partisan Cafe. It was a non-partisan, so it was all factions of the British left lived together for three and a half years in this cafe, which was not devoted to politics as such, but to jazz and playing chess and art exhibitions and talking. And, um, but a lot of interesting things happened there. Stuart Hall founded New Left Review there. Eric Hobsbawm created a particular school of thought there. Raymond Williams, E.P. Thompson, all the sort of great men of the British left were there in the late 50s. CND, the campaign against nuclear disarmament was there. So it was really an extraordinary living together with conditions that these people were playing out. The next. So these are just some images from Partisan Cafe, which show you not a very fancy place. And the next. This is my favorite image from Partisan Cafe because it is, I don't know about some, wanting something better. And the next. Um, we found Partisan had been open for three years. That's it. We found a historian at London University who's been working on it for over 17 years. <laughs> so we invited him to join us. He brought in a whole archive. We weren't able to use that archive because we couldn't afford the copyright 
to show those things. So we brought in a group of brilliant students we happened to have by chance that year who were by profession designers and they designed us an incredible kind of display mode with projections and all kinds of ways so that we could use the, the in the next. So this is another, you can see all kinds of different ways of, of um, that. Now, this is a, a, a floor of an adjacent building that I curated, and it's, um, it's called Archives of Substance. One of the things that I'm really interested in is how do we archive the intangible, things like substance and affect and atmosphere, how can we archive it? It's not possible to archive. So one of the ways to do it is through a process of singularizing. You put them together in relation to other archives and they start speaking together about something. Um, so one of these archives was um, Partisan Cafe, which was Mike Berlin's project. Next. Um, the second archive, which some of you may know, is Vali Makhloujis. Vali is a, an Iranian curator. Um, Vali Makhloujis' archive of the Shiraz Persepolis Festival. Now, the the sort of it is his archive because Shiraz Persepolis was a festival that existed for ten years, between sixty three and seventy three. It was run by ten Marxist intellectuals and its patron was Faradiba, the Empress of Persia. So it was a really weird kind of conjunction. And um, when Ayatollah Khomeini came in in 1979, the first fatwa he issued was against Shiraz Persepolis. So the entire archive was destroyed. So Vali has conjured up an archive out of nothing by finding a bit of a poster of something else and digitizing it and producing it as, as an, an image, etc. There's only a series of, of videos that are here in Paris at the National Audio Archive um, that Iran couldn't get its hands on, and that is here. But again, it was very expensive to get permission, so we did a bit, but not much. What you will see in this archive, which is extraordinary, um, is the sort of, of conjunction of the decolonizing world and the, the sort of Western avant-garde. So there are meetings there that we had, have never seen anywhere else. There's a poster there somewhere of, from 1971 about a meeting in, Te in Iran between Ingmar Bergman and Satyajit Rai. In 1971. That's not something that was taking place in London. So the, the Shiraz Persepolis was a, a kind of extraordinary entity. Um, but the next. This is one of the audiovisual pieces. It's a performance of going up a mountain and down a mountain, etc. So this, this is kind of one of the few original things we have. Um, and this this is more, so you can see Katakali dance, um, Merce Cunningham, an image of uh, Stockhausen and somebody else sitting piano to piano playing. Um, a, a really, really an extraordinary conjunction. Um, this is an archive that I've been making together with my students in London and the students in Helsinki at Alto University. Um, and it's called An Anecdoted Archive of Exhibition Lives. And it's about moments of transformation through viewing exhibitions. And so we interviewed a lot of people. These are non-canonical exhibitions and in non-canonical sp spaces. So they're not Moscow, New York, um, Paris, Berlin. Um, Kader Atiyah, you know, Elvira Djangiani Ose, Yvette Courage. Lots of people, some of them known, some of them unknown, each talking about a really early experience in their life of encountering an exhibition and having their thinking transformed by it. Next. 
Um, this is uh, Bonaventure Dikong. He's the founder of Savi Contemporary in Berlin. He's originally from Cameroon. And when we started this project, we really didn't know what we were doing. Um, and Bonaventure was the first person we interviewed, and he understood the project far better than we did, and he kind of nailed the interview. Mm -hmm. So he became a mascot because we learned about the project from his interview. And so he's bigger than everybody else. Um, and this is a, a bit of, of, this is my friend, the one who, who um, talks about the Palestinian plant. And the next, the Kaderat. Um, this is another archive that was on that floor. It's the, the seminars that we taught, each one with the subject of the seminar, a text from the seminar, kind of, of a quote from, from that text, etc. Um, this is um, another occasion of the city seminar. And this is the library of all the texts that we were reading over the two and a half years. Um, and this is probably the last project. Um, this is a really amazing project. Um, this is generated by Stefano Harney. Um, it's called Shipping and the Shipped. And his contention, because he deals with logistics and critical management studies, um, it's his contention that um, you cannot separate the history of the shipping of shipping from the history of the human cargo that was shipped, and that it is slavery that is behind the globalization of the shipping industry, not because a globalized shipping industry existed and it could ship slaves. So, um, and so he did this. He, he started inviting people. This is Ranjit Kukaragan, who is an Indian artist. Um, he made a big sound piece in um, one of the yards where ships are being broken up. So I think you've got something here. Yeah. Right. So these, this is in, in Pakistan and this is in India. But it's basically because of the same very lax laws against toxic poisoning that um, the, the big companies send their ships to India to be broken up. So he was making a sound piece in one of these yards when his father's old ship arrived in the yard by chance to be broken up. And on that ship, he found his father's photographic archive. And so he made this, this um, whole project around the sound piece, the archive, an additional piece that he was making off the coast of Norway. Um, so that was one part. This is a film of Denise Ferrer da Silva made by Arjun and Neumann, which is really about biopolitics in the Anthropocene. And um, it's, again, I think you can find it online now. It's a pretty interesting film. Okay, sorry, can, can we go one back because I want to, to wait for a minute. So basically, Shipping and the Shipped was a series of different projects which had to do partly with shipping, partly with the histories of those who had been shipped and the, the kind of, of ongoing lives that they created in Brazil here and there. And, um, and it kind of came together in a, in a very interesting and not very obvious sort of, of way. So it was, it was a, a kind of non-didactic meditation on shipping and the ship. Um, and this is the final, this is the final project. This is our infrastructure summit. Now we put the summit in the hands of Adrian Heathfield, who is one of us. And Adrian is, as I said, a performance person. And he did something I've never experienced before. He made the summit a performance piece, written and directed by himself, with us as the actors, without us knowing that we were playing <laughs> roles. And he did it, and, and this, is, this is why it's relevant. Because I was talking about living with conditions. 
he did it in a, in a way that he simply changed the relations between the parts. So if in a normal conference you have one presentation after the other, discussion, more presentations, here we had a few presentations and a lot of lunch. So um, that was where the rest of our budget went. We had lunch for 300 people. We had an abundant sardine factory on the water. We set up, we found some artists whose practice was cooking. They set up this fantastic lunch, long tables. People spat for two and a half hours and discussed what they heard in the morning. So all the components were stretched in a different relation. And it created something, I've never, you know how conferences are, everybody's looking miserable and oppressed. And, more papers, more and more and so on. And here everyone was so happy. They were eating and drinking and talking. Um, this is Stefano's gang. So Stefano is there in the middle. Fred Moten on the right. Hippothea Volum is from Athens. And Wutsan, who's a filmmaker from LA, and who was also part of Stefano's shipping in the ship. Next. Um, and this is Elizabeth Povinelli with the rest of us. Um, and this, this is our kind of, of attempt to pull together a live event um, of and on infrastructure. I think that's it. So, um, so this is a kind of, of description of the project. Now, uh, it was a, a new triennial. We got lots and lots and lots and lots of reviews most of them really awful. Um, everybody said it's too serious, it's not art, uh, we don't understand it. Um, and I wanted to think, and that's what I'm thinking about right now, about what it means to be the viewer of research. I think to be the viewer of research is a completely unexplored terrain. And so that's what I'm trying to do now, to think about what it's not, which is finding things out, right? Um, and what it could be, which is some kind of immersive experience in a set of knowledges um, that go beyond stating the facts. So one of the things that um, I'm thinking about is the absolute equivalent to what you know from reading books. There are books that tell you really, really interesting things in totally dull ways. <laughs> and there are books that produce a dramaturgy out of knowledge that are a completely different experience of reading. And I'm interested in thinking about research practices that are displayed and shared in the visual arena in terms of that kind of dramaturgy. So I'm, I'm going to stop here because um, it doesn't leave us enough time for discussion. But um, I think that there's, there's a great deal to unpack and think about in terms of, um, not, not the display of research as such, but what is demanded from the viewer of research, uh, what they might think that they are doing, um, what would turn it into a kind of experience where you come out with more than just information? Uh, but what would turn it into, okay, to use my language, what would turn it into a transformative experience? Because that's what I'm interested in, in teaching, in curating, and so on. I'm interested in transformative experiences. So that's really the, the uh, what I wanted to present to you. and. Um, any kind of discussion that you wish to have, I'm happy to have questions, <laughs> comments, criticisms, disavowals, whatever you wish. Um, I think we have. Hmm? Start with this. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation, first of all. Um, we identify a lot with, with the project we told you before about, the Escuela Garaje, like our big school that lasted three months. 
there was no feedback at all from the critic or from the critical apparatus in Colombia. And we've thought about that a lot. And why was there no, yes, uh, not a response in that way? And we believe it in a way when you hack and tweak uh, formats that come from the exhibition making and take them to the production of knowledge or the discursive, we don't know yet what category fits best. There is also a change in, um, oh yeah, although you need like new ways of, uh, crit of making critique or criticality towards that. Um, because by perhaps also what happened to you has to deal with that, that the reviews were negative in the way that was measured through the parameters of exhibition making and like a more object oriented practice. Perhaps, and um, what I want, yeah, more of the discussion that I wanted to say is, for example, like seeing Cosmopolis, like this, mm -hmm. what's happening here, it's very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Since we're doing a residency, we've had time to see how people deal with the space, mm -hmm. how they work around it. You can see the expectations. You can see a lot of expectations broken down. Uh, people who can who only stay in the space for minutes yeah. because they don't understand anything. People who take more time, people who are more open and to see it as perhaps yes archives mm -hmm. and to see and to read the information because there's also like a lot of text mm -hmm. and there's a lot of projects that are the results of yes of practices that take years and they are very complex objects in themselves. It's not like a more traditional art object. And the the thing with the public is very interesting to see how much time they take, how they see the exhibition, how they react to different and certain pieces, and there's a whole thing of, of, of expectation. But for me, one of the things that you showed was the the part inside cafe, like the Bergen version, of having people only pay to be there to talk. I <laughs> think that's amazing. And for me, for example, what yes, one of the in, most interesting things and works that's been doing that happens inside Cosmopolis is the mediation team, but there's only two people for all of this. So also like the amount of people that come and can talk with them is also very, yes, it doesn't work that well. I mean, you could have more like a team of bigger people talking to people all the time, like trying to activate the works. And I think that's something fundamental when you change also the idea of event in a way, so I really like this thing of the Partisan Cafe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of fell into curating without ever having intended to do it. And, um, it's just a series of circumstances. And in the beginning, I thought, okay, so how am I going to assess if something worked? I thought, lots of visitors and good reviews. <laughs> After the first project, I thought, no, this doesn't tell me anything. Um, have I changed? And more importantly, has the institution in which I'm working changed? And so that became a really different way of working because so much of the effort that I put into projects now is I put into the people working in the institution. The, the sort of, of, you know, exploring together how it can be more than it is. And that's, that's a kind of, of, of interesting shift of attention. And, um, but I, I think the discussion that we need to have about being viewers of research is not one about of how to do it better. It's not about that. Um, it's, it's to do with the temporality of the museum, which is you know in, out, view, ab absorb, leave. Um, it's to do with the temporality of the museum and the possibility, I mean, what do we have at our disposal to change that, to, to make the temporality a different one? And, and that's one of the things that I'm really, I'm really sort of thinking about. And how, how do we kind of, of think about research 
not as reports from exotic places mm. um, with hardships, but how do we think about research as offering a platform of shared experience? And what kind of museological and exhibitionary mm. devices do we have at our disposal to create that? So I, I no longer think that putting out somebody's research is good enough. Right? The, the sort of, of, of we have to kind of use many more talents. It's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in working with performance people all the time. Because they have just another understanding of space, another understanding of communication. And um, they, they do really interesting things. Like they produce incredibly tight, disciplined protocols that you have to give into. And it's only by giving into the protocols that you can transcend them. If you start fighting against them, nothing happens. So there's an incredible amount to learn from working with people who work in performance because they understand dramaturgy completely differently. They don't create high operatic moments, right? They create duration and some kind of a going through something together. And I think that's what a research exhibition can be. An exchange. That, an exchange and a, a process by which we go through something together. Yes. Those who are putting it on, those who are viewing it, those who are making it. It's, it's kind of... But there's a tremendous amount for us to, to sort of understand, I think, about the, that position. Yeah. You're talking about the temporality of the museum, but when I was listening to the previous question and to your answer, where I was thinking about the current, the contemporary tendency to this question of the economy of the attention and how do we, the media deal with this temporality of uh, attention. Because uh, I, I've been involved myself in public art projects. For instance, one of the dramaturg dramaturgical problems we have is how to deal with uh, a younger audience who are willing things to happen immediately. 20 seconds, 30 seconds of this economy of attention. Have, have you reflect upon these issues? How do you deal with this temporality of the pro art, art making process, temporality of the film, temporality of the exhibition? And the, it's, it's one of those you know, things that you can't take on. The changing temporality of digital culture is not something that we can take on. It's there. I think that for me, a much more productive route to go down is the exploration of exhaustion. So I've been writing this text for efflux for the exhausted viewer of research. And everybody thinks, because the, the critics that we took around and gave guided tours to in Bergen, they said, oh, it's exhausting. And this is supposed to be a bad thing. But if you're a Deleuzean, and I am a Deleuzean, <laughs> exhaustion is the, the highest level of transformation that can take place, because something falls apart and something else grows. So I'm, I'm really sort of thinking about the exhausted viewer, not as somebody who's tired and hasn't got any more patience, but as the site of some kind of a transformation, and opting out and then opting into something else, and, and so on. So, because I can't take on the 21st century digital culture temporalities, they're beyond me. Um, I am sort of thinking a lot about the way in which we think the viewer should be eager and energetic and absorb everything. Why? Yes, but we often lose the viewer. Yes, but we often lose the viewer before being able to. Fatigue, uh, fatigue. Yeah, but we never, for example, in my next exhibition, should there be such a thing, the opening banner is going to be, be exhausted. <laughs> be as exhausted as you possibly can. And, and, and not to, and to think about information overload, 
you know, in that sense rather than in a productive sense. So I, I think the problem is us and our expectations and our vocabulary, um, which is kind of being disappointed because we're demanding things that are not really possible. So I guess that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Um, well, I actually had the pleasure to studying with you. I was part of Julia. I, that's me. <laughs> um, I was part of a wonderful project that you read, um, kind of funded in in London. That it's this PhD group that is called Curatorial Knowledge, which is. I don't know, to me, I wasn't even a PhD student, I was actually doing a master's here and it was kind of like, I don't know, like drinking fresh air, like fresh water when you're like super thirsty and you're like, I don't know, kind of your brain is full of everything that, you know, everyone's telling you what curating is and like, you know, just going and see like tons of exhibitions and being exhausted but like not in the good way I guess and just like not really understanding what we're doing so um so yeah I was I was in London for a year on and off and that was like a really transformative experience actually um I'm very and, glad to hear that. yeah <laughs> um and now I'm actually working and I'm actually working with council which is actually part of this project and it was actually part of the Bergen assembly as well I wasn't there yet but um so my question is, so when I got to, when I arrived at council, I was actually asked to like think of like how to deal with like communication in the good, I mean not communication in terms of like marketing because I mean, yeah, there's always something to market, but I mean really like how to, how to explain to people what we do and how to really make people, I don't know, engaged or interested or... So my question is, when a project is so much about making people assemble and like gathering people and... But actually the reality of things is that these assemblies happen very rarely because it maybe happens once a year because you find the conditions because someone invites you because but then it's very slow for like the rest of the year nothing happens i mean you kind of work from your office and you just need to try and like transmit something to other people who are very far away you don't really know like it's something very complex and all these like researches are actually very like the touch on very complex issues and so my question is how to um yeah, how to make, how to really create these, when you don't have the situations of assembling in real life, how you, you know, what you did in the Parkinson Cafe, when you don't have that, what is, what can be a way to um, actually make people aware of what you do? And because obviously when we talk to people, everything is much easier. I mean, the, obviously the best conversations and, the, you know, those moments in which you just meet someone, you explain what council is or like what I do or like all day and they're like, oh, yeah, like I kind of get it. But otherwise, it's like super difficult, like, because people are like, oh, do you do exhibitions? And you're like, well, not really. So, um, so yeah, when, when, when physical assemblies are difficult to create, how to, um, yeah, how to, I don't know. Okay. First of all, the program that you joined in London, that's an assembly. Yeah, no. It's an assembly. So the, the sort of, well, you turn everything that you do into an assembly. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only time I work alone is when I sit and write. But otherwise, everything is an assembly. And the, the sort of, of, and the assumption is that if you put out there a really interesting question, people will gather around it. And I have never been disappointed in this. You know, in, in, 
But as long as I've been working in the public sphere, they don't assemble around me or us. They assemble around the question. That's what brings them together. And the, the sort of book, and I think it's actually easier than we envisage. The, the sort of turning sort of working processes into much more public events, sort of, of I used to run this really wonderful thing called the European Conversation on Cultural Difference. And it was a lot of people working in culture around Europe. And after we built up some trust between ourselves, because we didn't know each other before, people would come and say, this is my current project. And it's all wrong. And laying it on the table for a whole day, and then the next day, having everybody there in the room pick it apart hmm. and sort of talk about what's wrong with it. And it required a certain amount of trust because you're vulnerable when you, and also people not talking about it outside. But it was an absolutely amazing forum. And it was around, it was a forum that was around the way in which we don't know how to deal with cultural difference. And um, so, the, the sort of, of, I think that creating sort of, of public platforms of assembly is a lot easier than we think. And it, it always works really well when you don't know how to think something, you don't know how to do something, you don't know how to solve something. That's when people come together. The, the sort of, of, if you have like a perfect discourse, who cares? Right? It's yet another kind of seamless, unenterable performance of one's greatness. But when you say, I have a problem, all those who share my problem come gather, that's when assembly happens. And the, the sort of, of, and I think it's a great deal easier to affect than you're, you're assuming. Uh, it's, it's, there's a certain element of risk and, and you know, self-revealing that is involved in it. It's not that great a risk, I don't think. It's only the, the I think the, the companionship is worth the risk, shall we say. Mm. And the other thing I, I think I don't share with you is I don't think need, things need to be seamless and easily understood. And I, I don't think that's an issue. Um, I, there's a difference between being boring and being complicated. <laughs> I think boring is awful. But complicated is not always awful. I, I was telling Ilaria before that I did a version of this talk in Sardinia, outside in a park at night with kids running around and joggers and dogs and chaos. And I looked at this situation and I thought, how, how am I going to put my you know, stuff forward in these conditions? And then I said, sorry for the audience, uh, for what is going to happen here, but seriousness is my only weapon against neoliberal capital. It's all I have to fight it off. And it was amazing. The minute I said weapon, everybody sat up straight and listened. Right? So that's a dramaturgy, right? Because it's it's about a fight. And what you have the other thing is no one invites us for our curatorial ability, which is not all that impressive to be quite frank about it. They invite us for our seriousness. You know, the six of us produce an unbelievable level of serious intensity. And, and I've, I've understood that this is a very precious commodity. Hmm. And that's what we're invited for. So then, what do we do with it? Then that's the big question for me, is great. We know how to produce amazing levels of seriousness. What do we do with that? It's an open question.
We're nearly out of time, so if anyone has a very final burning question before we wrap up. Otherwise, we'll finish with an amazing level of service. On a high note.